Um, so yeah, welcome everybody uh, to this second Ideas in Practice event. So we had our first one in the morning and it was a huge success. So we're really excited about doing another one. Um, basically what this whole initiative is about is uh, there are a bunch of us who are like physics and philosophy students at U of T. And we found that there was sort of a, a niche that had a lot of people interested in seeing discussions between people who are philosophers and who are non-philosophers, but have like shared interests. And so, and there's a lot of people who study at very high levels related subjects from different angles. So we kind of wanted to create an opportunity for people of different, like people in different departments, for example, to come together and actually discuss things with each other that are of common interest. And so that's what we're doing now. Um, and today we're talking about, we've got a, a very broad prompt of how, no, how knowledge and computers are related in whatever way they might be related, uh, which is of course a very, very broad topic, um, but one that we think you guys are all uh, somewhat experts in, in different aspects. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's what this is all about. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to getting going with this. So the, the format for this um, discussion session will be uh, first that each speaker will have five minutes or so to just explain their personal or view or opinions on, on the topic of knowledge and machines. Then we'll dive into a 45 minute moderated discussion. And at the very end, we'll have um, a Q and A with the audience. So I guess what uh, we'll start off by doing is we'll just introduce uh, each speaker and after their introduction, they'll have um, their, uh, their five minutes to um, introduce their position. So the first speaker today is Chris Mink. So Chris is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Western Ontario and the director of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy. He studies the history and philosophy of physics co and cosmology in particular, as well as general philosophy of science. Recently, he has been studying the epistemology of simulations. So Chris, you can take it away. Great, well, thank you very much to Patrick and Hannah for inviting me. And this is the kind of discussion that I really enjoy when you have people from different disciplines all talking about a topic of common interest. So I think it's undoubtedly true that there's a lot of fields in science that will rely on using computer simulations to make progress in the 21st century. So there's a lot of open problems that we'll only be, be able to address using computer simulations. Now I'm particularly interested in cosmology, but philosophers have gotten interested in how we can reliably use simulations to generate new knowledge in a broad array of different fields. There's a particularly large literature, as you might guess, on climate modeling and climate simulations, just given the importance of those for policy decision-making. So a really central question that has drawn philosophers into this field, and it's one that the scientists are facing as well, is how can we establish the reliability of simulations of complex systems? And how can we promote understanding of the systems uh, that, we're that we're using the simulations to describe? So in what sense do simulations contribute to our real physical understanding of the nature of these systems? And so let me just describe why I think this is a really challenging question very briefly. And then uh, that will sort of, I hope, set a, at least a question before us for discussion. And to do that, let me say a little bit about how simulations are built in cosmology. And I'll try to be very brief and this will be very sketchy. But typically in astrophysics and cosmology, you start with a sort of physical understanding of different aspects of the systems you're describing. Um, and then in developing a simulation, you'll try to, you'll often have a system of say differential equations describing some of the quantities of interest. And then you need to implement that on a computer. So you need to use say some kind of numerical solver. So in cosmology, so if we're thinking about large scale structure formation, that is how do galaxies form from initial seed perturbations in the early universe, we're often only interested in, in how things interact gravitationally. So the question will be, how do we describe a system of masses interacting gravitationally? And can we give a, a, a sort of plausible picture of how the structures we see when we observe the universe can form? And so when we introduce uh, when we write down a computer algorithm to describe this, 
we need to simplify and change the differential equations into a set of numerical equations that that, that, that computer program or algorithm can implement. And so we often have to introduce false assumptions at this stage. So for example, we don't use the exact description of the force that we think would be appropriate. We often have to make simplifications or changes to uh, counteract or control the numerical analysis that we're doing. So I won't go into the details here, but for example, you might have a force softening algorithm, which in, in certain circumstances, you could have collisions between particles that would lead to huge accelerations as the particles collide. You wanna keep those accelerations from occurring because that will lead to sort of instabilities. It will lead to the numerical problem solving going awry. So you introduce something called force softening, which sort of eliminates that source of instabilities. So the, the main point though, is just that you have a kind of false picture of the dynamics that you have to introduce in order to have something that you can implement numerically. Now, the other point is that in developing a model, you often have sort of different modules describing different aspects of the physics that you then have to put together. So you would have one module describing the gravitational dynamics, but then if you're trying to model different scales in a cosmological case, you'd want to introduce other aspects of the system as well. And so for each aspect of that, you'd have a description of the physics. You'd then try to implement that by writing an algorithm. And then you try to put them together to formulate a computer simulation. Now, I think the really challenging question that comes in evaluating the simulations comes when we assess the result of this process, because we often look at a global output. So now if you look at computer simulations of galaxies that are available now, unlike when I was first studying this a long time ago, you get these beautiful pictures of things that look like real galaxies. So you can run a simulation and you get a picture that most cosmologists wouldn't be able to distinguish from an actual galaxy catalog or an image of a galaxy. The problem is you've often tuned the simulation to get an output like that. And what that means is that you have the modules you've put together often have parameters or there's ways that the algorithm has to combine information from different modules. And there's a lot of plasticity. There's a lot of freedom as you're doing the simulation as to how you, how you construct it. Now that plasticity is crucial because it allows you to construct a successful simulation. But the problem is that you then might lose an understanding of what each of those pieces actually contributed. Um, and so one uh, thing that philosophers have used to describe this is that we say that simulations are opaque. It's often hard to see what has actually gone into the simulation that made it successful. So the, the plasticity is crucial in order to be able to build a successful simulation. You have to have that flexibility in order to get the global output to look as it should. But after you've done the tuning and changing of the simulation to get the global output, the worry is that you might have canceled out different sources of errors that were present in each, each of those modules. And so that cancellation of errors might mean that you're able to produce a specific output, but then there's a different question that you could ask, that then it's much harder to answer, which is how can I generalize from the success of the simulation and describing the particular cases that I designed it to reproduce? So there's two different senses of generalization. Could I trust what it says about some other feature that I wasn't paying attention to when I was constructing it? Or could I apply it to a different case? And your hope is that if, if you understood the physics and the simulation actu accurately captured the physics, it would also then apply to these other cases and you'd understand its limitations. The problem is because of the opacity, we don't really know what success tells us. So even though we've been very successful in describing and designing these simulations, it's hard to know how to generalize from that. It's hard to know where to go with the simulations. So I think this is a really, really interesting challenge that we have simulations that are successful, but we have to probe them further in order to determine what that success really tells us. Does it really tell us that we understand the physics of galaxy formation? Does it, and just to, to put a pin in it, the, one of the things that is interesting here is that cosmologists are actually interested in testing fundamental physics by looking at galaxy formation. So, You've probably heard that there's discussions about dark matter. 
Um, one of the reasons why these galaxy formation simulations are so important in cosmology is that the one of the best ways to probe the nature of dark matter and whether there really is dark matter is by its consequences for galaxy formation. So the cosmologists are interested in this question partially to understand whether dark matter is a correct description of what's there. And so we really need to understand whether the success of the models reflects on this physical hypothesis about dark matter. Um, but that's really an, a, a, a really central challenge. What does the success of these models tell us given that simulations are so opaque to us? We just don't understand them because of the complexity and because of the way they're constructed, it's hard to see if we have cancellation of errors or actually a true physical understanding of the system. Okay, so I'll stop there. That's, there's responses to that challenge, which we can discuss, but let me just stop by getting the challenge on the table. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so now we're gonna introduce our other two speakers as well. So next up, we have Dr. Karina Vold. So Karina is an assistant professor at the Institute for History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto. Uh, her research is in a very different direction and it pertains uh, more so to the ethics of artificial intelligence and philosophy of artificial intelligence, as well as other issues in cognitive science. Um, she's explored topics such as extended cognition and ethical design of artificial intelligence and things like that. So uh, welcome, Karina. Thanks, Patrick. And, and thanks to both Hannah and you for having me. And thanks, Chris, as well, for that first um, provocative provocation, I guess, which I think was really good. Um, so yeah, so I'll sort of offer a different perspective from um, my sort of background in philosophy of cognitive science and um, philosophy of situated cognition. So um, I wanted to kind of suggest two ways in which um, machines can help generate or at least support knowledge generation in humans. Um, so this would be rather than seeing the machine itself as some kind of bearer of knowledge. So in the first case, I wanna suggest that um, AI systems can support um, what I call, or what a co-author and I have called internalization. And in particular, I'll focus on the possibility of AI transforming a conceptual space. And then I'll also talk a little bit about the possibility of um, cognitive extension through AI, through AI and how um, these systems can improve some of our cognitive capacities and potentially thereby allowing us to improve generation of knowledge. So um, in the first case, I wanna start with an example of AlphaGo. So I'm sure that all of you have heard of AlphaGo. Um, it's one of DeepMind's, uh, what was, it was one of DeepMind's ventures, the system that was um, attempting to um, Play Go very um, successfully and ended up beating one of the world uh, world champions, Lisa Dahl, in a, a series of matches. So AlphaGo was trained from um, human moves. Um, so I think it trained off a, a data set of um, human games first, and then it went on to play against itself. So um, it understands, broadly speaking, how humans play, but it also came to be able to look beyond how humans play to entirely different levels of games. And the way that it was thought to do this, um, if you look at how it, its components work is through a Monte Carlo tree search method. So um, the philosopher Marta Helena, for example, has argued that this uh, Monte Carlo tree search method is analogous roughly to the kind of mental scenario building that um, seems to underlie insight in humans and non-human animals. Although interestingly, although AlphaGo was extremely successful, it also seemed to lack another mechanism that did, does seem to broadly some broad agreement that underlies insight in human and animals, which is um, domain generality. Um, but nevertheless, um, through, the, through the Monte Carlo tree, tree search method, um, it went on to play moves that were really surprising to human players. So in particular, I'll focus on the sort of famous move 37. So um, this one move in the game, AlphaGo had calculated there was a one in 10,000 chance that a human would make that move but it drew on all the knowledge that it had accumulated by playing itself so many times. And the, the, the games against itself are often described as frenetic. So they look very um, different than against human players. Um, but anyways, it decided to move, make the move anyways. And after it made the move, it, that move was described as pivotal in, in winning the game. And, it, and in fact, it was seen as such a surprising move. So um, some of the commentators described it as um, surprising and novel and even creative. And, um, what was interesting is that human Go players seem to rely on, and when they learn Go, they seem to rely on conceptual and linguistic tools like proverbs. Um, so for example, they'll have a proverb like the second line is the route to defeat. 
So you learn never to play on the second line and it's hard to see the second line as anything but a route to defeat. Whereas what AlphaGo did was, was break some of the common wisdom in those proverbs. And so um, what's suggested by this is that it's sort of presenting new conceptual ways of playing this game that don't accord with some of the human cultural uh, norms that come, that come with us when we learn that game. So um, what Helena has described this as, for example, as, as a way of overcoming functional fixedness. So we, we use functional fixedness as a way of testing for creativity in animals. And it's the idea that you can look past what an object was built to do and try to, to um, see and imagine how it can perform, can aid you in performing other tasks. So kind of about getting over those constraining norms about how you learn and play. So I want to suggest um, that, that this is really actually quite powerful and it's happening in, in game playing. And um, so it has these remarkable abilities that are specific to Go in the case of AlphaGo, um, but it's still allowed this great creative potential and, and arguably uh, meets the criteria of what the philosopher uh, Margaret Bowden calls transformational cre creativity. So it's um, produced novel, surprising, valuable solutions to a problem within a domain. And so I think that's really exciting, actually. And I, um, what's exciting about it is the potential that that has to overcome um, functional fixedness in other domains. So if you consider, for example, so turning to the um, other DeepMind venture into scientific discovery, AlphaFold. So AlphaFold recently made headlines for helping to solve a 50-year-old grand challenge in biology. And the deep neural network there uh, predicted um, how proteins fold into three-dimensional shapes. Um, which is this uh, extremely complex process that's fundamental to understanding um, basically the biological machinery of life. So it's pretty impressive. And um, what it's doing in the, both these cases, and in AlphaGo it's making moves based on its predictions, but in AlphaFold it's making predictions. And so uh, we won't want to say that these systems generate scientific knowledge on their own, of course, but it, what it's doing is contributing pieces of evidence for us that we then have to go try to make sense of and understand in much the way I think Chris was suggesting leads to all sorts of challenges. So it's not straightforward that we're gonna be able to always make sense of these predictions. But I think it's also really critical because it's really the only way that humans can, can sort of keep up with machines and, and try to uh, contribute to these and make sense of these advances in the progress of knowledge. And we're seeing that also in, in mathematics too. So for a long time, um, there's been systems that um, have tried to you know, prove theorems um, and particularly mathematicians are, mathematicians are trying to build theorems, build these machines in ways that can prove theorems that we can understand. <laughs> so I'm trying to get across. So um, there's been some, some systems that have been able to prove theorems through just brute force mechanisms, but it's just too exhaustive for humans to understand. So to try to do that in a way that can be communicated to humans. So I call that internalization. And the idea there is that we wanna try to have some method where humans can start to learn from these systems. So in the case of AlphaGo, for example, um, human players are now trying to train on the moves that AlphaGo did and to try to um, extract wisdom from that in the form of things like proverbs so that humans can try to learn from them. Okay, I, I don't know where I'm at with time, but I'll, I'll just say there's one other um, way that I think uh, is important that uh, AI can help us generate um, knowledge and that's through essentially cognitive extension. So I'll assume that most people are pretty comfortable with the idea of the extended mind thesis, uh, whether you agree with it or not, maybe you um, have at least heard of it. And um, I think AI offers new possibilities for how we can extend our cognitive capacities into tools that we use since they're so powerful. And, so powerful in fact that some people want to say they have minds of their own. But they can certainly, I think, help us in new ways that um, artifacts in the past, like static tools like a pen and paper, maybe couldn't have. So be because of their sophistication. So they can, they can model our preferences, they can model our social networks, they can model all sorts of features about our, our psychology that maybe even we can't access fully. And in doing so, they may be able to make uh, powerful suggestions for how we can conduct our lives, whether it's planning, decision-making, acting, providing us with new forms of metacognition or self-awareness, um, modeling the groups of our people in our networks to understand why they are make, maybe making the decisions they're making, for example. They can improve, uh, systems can improve our attention and our search capacities so that we can acquire knowledge more quickly in that respect. Uh, but even things like conceptualization and learning. So like the example from AlphaGo, we have new concepts coming into this game. So I think there's just a rich potential there as well. And I'll, I'll end there.
Thank you so much for those extremely salient examples. And I hope that we can discuss them uh, more later. Um, but our, our last speaker is Dr. Brendan Johns. Brendan is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at McGill University, where he runs the McGill Cognitive Computing Laboratory. His research focuses on the development of large scale computational models of cognition with specific emphasis on understanding the computational mechanisms that support the acquisition and representation of semantic information from naturalistic big data, as well as how this knowledge is used in online natural language processing and memory retrieval. So Brendan, thank you so much for agreeing to participate and we're so excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm a psychologist, so I understood about 30% of what uh, Karina and Chris <laughs> said. So um, I spend most of my days trying to figure out how long it takes people to read words. <laughs> um, so my, my work's a little bit lower level. Um, I was really interested to hear about, about Chris's and Karina's um, ideas of, of computation and how they affect different, different donate, domains. In psychology, there is a very, very rich history of, of computational work, um, going back to the sort of foundations of, of cognitive science, where um, when we started to move out of kind of behaviorism, which was the um, dominant paradigm for uh, psychology up until sort of the 1950s, 1960s, um, the, the sort of advent of the uh, computer really started to change people's minds. And so uh, at the beginning of, of cognitive psychology, when we started to think about kind of internal states and uh, internal representations of, of how we sort of compute information and things like that, um, the, the really early theories of cognition focused and, and took a lot of inspiration from the organization of computers. So um, the first major um, computational model of memory was a uh, model entitled the modal model of, of memory by Atkinson and Schifrin. Uh, Rich Schifrin was my postdoc advisor. He's still around. This paper was published in 1967 or 68. And so I think he's in his 80s, but he still like climbs mountains and stuff. So, um, and so this model basically took memory, which, which was considered like this sort of monolith and subdivided it in, into different sections that sort of corresponded to how your computer works. So you have a main memory, which is like your RAM, which is your short-term memory in our, in our, in our mind, um, or working memory is what it's called now. Um, you have your long-term memory, which is your hard drive, and then you have this sort of central executive, which is your processor. And so that's kind of inspired most of the kind of um, theories of, of how brains are organized and it, it it's not a model that that's accepted anymore, but but it's been subdivided and it's kind of served as the um, central component of how we think about the organization of the brain. And so, like like what Chris was suggesting about how you can how physicists can simulate um, like the evolution of um, galaxies and things like that, we can simulate different types of brain processes. So we can say, I think memory is working like this. So I designed this computational model. Um, mostly described with some sort of mathematical equations. Uh, most of the time now you have to simulate that a number of times to get some average behavior. And then you can, can, can um, show how that, that model's output maps onto your uh, human uh, behavioral subject. So you run these experiments and you have this model and you see how well the two match together. Um, if they match really well, then you use the model to generate more, more ideas about experiments. And so you have this sort of circular process where you're uh, generating better and better models. And so that's been for about 50 years now, uh, the dominant um, sort of in, in computational cognitive science, the dominant sort of paradigm to develop uh, theoretical notions of, of human behavior. Um, and so my research takes a little bit of a different approach to that. So I sort of went to graduate school when machine learning stuff was starting to become really popular, especially in language processing. So in like natural language processing. And when I was going through undergrad and graduate school, I was really amazed by what they can do. In particular, there's a paper by uh, Landauer and Dumais in 1997 Psych Review 
that describes their model called latent semantic analysis, which learns the meaning of words from a text corpus. And so this was a really interesting paper because it went back to like Plato or whatever. I'm not going to talk about Plato and a bunch of philosophers, but uh, looking at, at kind of the innate aspects of, of knowledge. So uh, Plato, Chomsky, lots of people throughout the history of cognitive science have said that knowledge is this or requires this kind of uh, innate aspect of cognition. It's something that's that there, there are sort of base concepts that are a part of our mind that have evolved through natural selection or, or whatever. Um, so Alice, Alice A was this really initial um, analysis showing how much information can actually be extracted from the linguistic environment that people are embedded in. And it works pretty well. It's, it's still a model that people use now. Um, and so what this, that, that kind of model, which is sort of the base of my research, uh, they're entitled distributional model of semantics. There's a bunch of different kinds. Um, the most popular one now is word to vec by Google, but in my opinion, they all kind of work, work the same. But what they allow us to do is to examine the informational complexity of the environment that humans are embedded in. And so by examining that complexity, you are able to measure the amount of learnability that, that we are um, capable of extracting. So instead of making these really broad assumptions about, about the things that people have sort of innate in their mind, we can say, you know, that doesn't have to be built into the system because it's already available to us through our everyday life. Um, so, so sort of going back to these sort of Chomsky arguments about poverty of the stimulus and, and that sort of thing is, um, is kind of is 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 the base of my research. And so, I think just by sort of reading the the, the proposals of this this panel, uh, I think it's really interesting in that that sort of conception of of cognition is basically like machine learning conception like so going back to sort of the modal model where we're talking about using the hardware aspects of computers to um, form metaphors about, about human cognition now we're sort of moving on to these other metaphors which are based on these ideas of machine learning which are sort of the dominant uh, practice in in computer science now so it's kind of a an interesting evolution of of different aspects of of computation and cognition so Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks a lot for that overview. I think that, I mean, all of you are working on very different things, but it's really cool to see kind of a, a lot of the sort of structural similarities in, in and, and what how there's a lot of common ground that you guys are all looking at. Um, so to quick to, to kick off the discussion, um, I want to start out with a question which is hopefully fairly straightforward to say, but has a lot, I think, loaded into it. Um, so when we sort of very naively start to think about modeling uh, knowledge of an agent in terms of some, like if, if we want to start to model the knowledge of an agent computationally, the very minimal way that we would start to do that would be to suppose some very simplistic propositional logical structure and, and then consider the brain to just be something that runs the propositional calculus to prove such is true, such is false. Um, and that is clearly a, a vast oversimplification, but when it comes to just at the bottom using logic to sort of study knowledge abstractly, that's a very easy tool to use. So um, I think a good place to get going would be to ask you guys um, in what ways uh, cognition actually differs from this very simplistic propositional picture, this very basic crunching of Zero one zero one. How 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 is it a lot more complicated than that? I'll just start and say that I don't have a lot to say, but I'm really interested to hear what my co-panelists have to say. I think the one of the things that's striking, though, and this came out in Brendan's comments already, is that there's one way that AI has had a huge impact on the study of the mind, which is when you try to build something that does what we can do, um, you discover what works and what doesn't work. And I think that the kind of picture that you've proposed is something that people have tried at various points in AI, and it just didn't work as well as other approaches. So in some sense, we can learn about how, I mean, we might be able to learn how the mind works just by trying to build a mind-like thing in AI. And I don't know nearly as much about this as my co-panelists, so I'll throw it to them. 
<laughs> Brendan, do you want to go? <laughs> and... <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll just say briefly that that is like going back to the 70s and 80s, that was a major component of, of many cognitive models. In AI, it evolved into expert systems, which are still somewhat used. Uh, the military uses them a lot because they're just like these systems that have all of this knowledge put into them and they behave in certain fashion. So like the, the biggest model in cognition was, for a long time was ACTAR and that's what like controls a lot of drones and stuff now because they've sort of formulated all of this. Um, in, in cognitive science, that view, that ex extremely computational view of like everything being propositions, um, lost favor because of work in grounded cognition, which showed the importance of things like perceptual information in, in sort of every aspect of, of cognition. So there's a, a really good paper by Lawrence Barcelou in 1999, Brain and Behavioral Science, where it's like this giant paper where they, they sort of <laughs> show why these things, like the brain doesn't really do this. They rely on, on other, other sorts of information. And one of the things that, that Chris mentioned is just sort of that, that they can't adapt, right? So if you're only building in things that they, that you know, when you put it into a different situation, it, it can't really build upon it. So that's why the machine learning type approaches have been so powerful is that you can give them like 10,000 samples of somebody's writing and then they see somebody who's, who's writing they've never seen, they're able to, to adapt to it. Whereas if you try to build sort of abstracted knowledge into the system, it doesn't always work like that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can add much. I mean, I think that, um, so what you described, it sounds to me like just a classical GoFi type system. And I think that broadly speaking, we're understanding the human mind more as a connectionist model and therefore one with a parallel architecture as a dynamic or self-organizing system and one that doesn't have discrete localized representations like zeros and ones, but more likely to have distributed representations. So where all nodes across many hidden layers and an input and output layer potentially can be um, involved in uh, the representation of, of something outside of it. So there's lots of different, uh, there's lots of differences in a sense <laughs> um, that are all important. <laughs> and then that may not be a complete list. It probably isn't a complete list. And then there at the same time, there's this other question that seems to be going on here, which is more about the question of generality and um, domain generality and sort of the innateness and empiricist debate that's going on between people like John McCoon and Gary Marcus right now. So that seems to be like maybe a slightly different question because you can have, um, and we do have, of course, excellent high-performing um, connectionist models that are only good at narrow domains. That's essentially all we have. Um, and so those systems um, are very good at specific tasks and they can achieve a lot in specific tasks, but they're not very good at using the same core suite of cognitive resources to a wide range of different tasks. And that's what we see almost universally in biological organisms. So there's something very different there that's going on. And it's not obvious what we're missing yet. And it's not obvious, I mean, it could be, so it seems like the, the deep mind approach is highly empiricist. It could be that we just need to give a lot more data to these systems and that that's, we're really underestimating, for example, Cameron Buckner has argued that we're really underestimating just how much experience humans have. So you think that interacting with an object in the world over 10 minutes, let's say, I give this to a toddler, is that one interaction or is that hundreds of thousands of interactions because of all the different angles and also the replay that happens offline. So there's so much replay in terms of like memory and sleeping. And so it's really hard to know how to quantify that and make a comparison against how much data some of the systems like GPT-3 has that has tons of data trawling the whole internet but it's still hard to know what kind of a fair comparison would, would be there. And um, yeah, so, so I think that there's sort of the other question of what we need exactly to get to general intelligence is huge. So we can probe at that more if you guys need to. Other things like intentionality, like these notions that we have no idea how to build into a computational system, like in, in language development, for example, that's considered like, like the central notion of how we acquire language is by we interpret other people's behavior as being informative of how we how we should behave and so like theory of mind and stuff like that um like how do you build that into a computer is 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 very difficult yeah absolutely so i have a <clears throat> question unless there's something that um anyone would like to bring up but um 
I guess both Chris and Karina have alluded to the fact that when we use simulations in cosmology or, um, you know, for game playing, to we, we use simulations to um, help us learn about uh, physical reality, but we don't take their knowledge as scientific knowledge on its own. But what I find interesting is that Brendan brought up the fact that we often look to computers to inform our understanding of the human brain. And it seems to me that maybe in different fields, simulations are put on a uh, different footing. So in cosmology, we're able to build simulations and then actually go out and test directly what the results are in the real universe. Whereas is it, it, it is my understanding that it's harder to do that when your direct observation has to be of the brain making very complicated um, you know, computations. So is, is that true? Is, is there, are, are we more reliant on simulations in um, cognitive science? And is that a good thing? Is that at all a dangerous thing? So there's, it's the, in, in cognitive science, there's this thing called the Mars tri-level hypothesis. Um, so by this computational vision researcher, David Marr, um, in the early 1980s. So Marr set out three different levels of how we can understand human or any computational system. So one is the computational level, which is like the problem level. This is what like a, a cognition has to solve at some, some broad um, description. The algorithmic level is like how you actually solve that problem, the actual sort of computational routine that goes, goes into it. And then the, the lowest level is the hardware level, which is like how you implement that algorithmic algorithm in say a, a, a neural system. And so different cognitive models occupy different levels of that hierarchy. So like Bayesian models of cognition occupy at the top, um, which is like, you know, specifying the input output relation essentially of cognition. So like a system is giving this information, uh, it has to do this, this is the output of it. How do you sort of organize that information? The middle level is what I sort of tend to work at, which is like generating algorithms of how sort of people work. And then people like uh, who do computational neuroscience, for example, work at the lowest level where they have these extremely um, intricate models of how neurons behave. Um, and, and, you know, they're limited in that simulating the, the uh, behavior of any single neuron like is like a big computational task. Um, and so putting lots of things together is, is quite tough. And so scaling it up to um, levels of, of doing normal things like a, like a model I would work at is, is really tough, but um, there's lots of people doing, doing good work like, like that. I'd be interested to hear if, if, there's, if that kind of separation exists in, in, in other fields like physics, for example. <laughs> yeah, so I can say a little bit more. So um, I focus on cosmology just because it's what I happen to be interested in, but I think the real question about assessing reliability of simulations in physics, the place where that was uh, really started historically was in the Manhattan Project, because that was when Ulam, Teller, Metropolis, a group of people really needed to use uh, simulations for the first time to understand what would happen when they detonated the first nuclear bomb. And so in that case, it's clear that your decisions really rested on these simulations in a really important way. And there's a large literature in applied physics, which is devoted to determining the reliability of simulations, in particular in fluid mechanics and aeronautical design, because uh, because of the complications of fluid flow, you really can't do scale. There's a lot of things you can't resolve with scale modeling and so you still need to use simulations in these contexts. And so there's a lot of work that's devoted to um, addressing the challenges I posed it. So the, what I see is the challenges that simulations are often evaluated holistically, but in order to understand what you can reliably project from the success, you need to understand how the components work. And so, in different cases, you can do different sort of strategic responses to this challenge more or less effectively. So um, this is often called benchmarking. So for example, in cases where you do have a lot of experimental data, you can do, as Hannah was suggesting, 
you can actually look at the sort of extensions to different cases and say, okay, here's what the simulation would uh, uh, supply or lead us to expect in this case. And then you can do experimental study to see how it works. Or you can do sometimes analytic solutions where you just have an analytic solution to the underlying equations. And then you can compare and make sure your uh, simulation is giving you a numerically well-behaved result. The problem is that in some of the cases where we most need simulations, it's precisely because we lack those things that we need the simulations. So um, in the case of climate science, in the case of cosmology, we just don't have those sort of benchmarking uh, techniques readily available. And so I think it really is a, a challenge. I'll, I'll mention one other way that people have tried to address this. And this is not that satisfying, but it's uh, sometimes called robustness analysis or um, convergence studies. So depending on which literature you're looking at, there are different labels. But the idea is that let's say all five of us constructed a simulation to model some target system. Um, we each might make different decisions in how we constructed that. And let's say we each are successful in the sense of getting the global output correct. But the idea is that if we've each independently constructed the simulations, and yet all of our simulations, suppose they agree on both the target output and then agree on something else. Each of our simulations might have errors that cancel each other out, but if they're all sort of agreeing and are successful, then that should give us confidence that the further thing that they all agree on might also be a legitimate result. The problem is that when we build simulations, there's often just sociologically so much effort required to build a large scale simulation that the simulations we in fact have are not completely independent, right? So what's more likely to have happened is that somebody put a lot of effort into building a simulation and then all five of us would have slight variations on that simulation. And so the fact that we agree doesn't necessarily give us confidence that there's something correct that we're all that we're all uh, you know getting independent lines of evidence uh, to favor. So I think in that context, in the context of cosmology, it's partly that we lack the kind of benchmarking techniques that we can do in other areas of applied physics that makes this such a such a challenging question. I'll just say. Um... I think that just listening to what um, Chris was describing too, and I think there's got to be similar challenges there. It seems that there are similar challenges there with modeling the mind too, right? Um, because we just don't know what counts as relevant inputs in some cases or what counts as, um, you know, full representation of, of everything that's going on at every layer since, we, since there's so much mystery there. And then I'll also just add um, another thought, um, which is that, just, just, I guess, to highlight the idea that it really does depend on the context. It seems like there's just all these differences in different contexts of how we use AI, which is one of the beautiful things about this general purpose technology. And you notice that um, in uh, playing Go, for example, there's not necessarily a piece of knowledge or a, um, a single thing that we're striving for there. It's just to win, just to beat the game against the other player. So we can use that in kind of a different way. Some people, I mean, it's, it's thought that because Go is a game of perfect knowledge, there might be a way of actually evaluating the most optimal move, but that would take such a brute search method that, that that's not even what AlphaGo does. So um, because there's just too many uh, possible, possible moves, I think it's 10 to the power of 170 or something in Go. Um, so, it's, so, so the way they do that is um, differently. So, uh, so you guys have talked about this, this benchmarking problem. Uh, and how that kind of affects our ability to simulate uh, systems that we study empirically. So things like cosmological models, climate models, things of that nature. Um, but I want to shift a little bit to what is perhaps a, a cleaner example of trying to use computers to make epistemic appraisals. So when we are dealing with mathematics, when we talk about a mathematical deduction, uh, the extent to which we know something is mathematically true it is given by literally just carrying out the steps of some deductive calculus. Um, and typically, uh, so, so we'd be willing to say that we have knowledge of some mathematical result if we are aware of that deduction. And we might be willing to relegate the deductive process to a computer, provided it's sufficiently simple that we can go through and check step by step and make sure that, that we're happy with everything. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing to, to what extent can we call uh, 
a mathematical inference made by a computer knowledge if it is if the steps required by the computer to actually make the inference are so complicated that no human could ever check them and how does that bear on something like the extended mind uh, hypothesis and, and that kind of issue and um, i guess i'll respond to that one and <laughs> um, i think that this is the actual case, right? So that I think that there have been some theorems proved like the four color map theorem, I think, okay. Um, and that I think mathematicians in general weren't very satisfied because they knew the theorem was true, but in general, they were wanting to get understanding from the system and they wanted to know like why the system worked or how the system worked. Um, yeah, so I, um, I think that for, I have to think a little bit about what this means for it uh, and the extended mind. So I do, in short, I, I guess I want to say that it's a little bit, I think it's, it's a little bit more like the situation of having um, sort of experts in society. So I'm thinking about Burge's case of content externalism and less so a case of what Clark and Chalmers call vehicle externalism. Um, so it, um, if that makes enough sense to people. So, so I don't know that we would want to say a system like that unless it's tightly coupled to a particular user as an extension of that person's knowledge or mind, and then it would have to meet right, the right kinds of conditions. But there are lots of cases in society um, where there are, there are experts who bear the knowledge and that um, you know, we say we know something about a term um, in virtue of the fact that that knowledge rests with somebody else in society. So there might be more parallel to a case like that. I'd have to think it through a little bit more, but that's kind of my initial reaction there. I'm curious, there's a, a similar discussion that rises that uh, re regards explainable AI, right? So you have a machine learning algorithm that discovers a pattern in the data. Um, and then it might be, for example, a decision-making algorithm in a healthcare context where it decides here's the appropriate treatment. And there's been a lot of effort to say, how could we then explain how it arrived at that decision so that a doctor can actually both verify that it's an appropriate decision and sort of understand what's going on. And I think there's, this is a really interesting um, overlap with, there's a lot of discussions in philosophy and philosophy of science about what constitutes explanation in a, in a more sort of theoretical context. And I actually think that the philosophers have a fairly deflationary account of what constitutes explanation. So that if you have a kind of causal understanding of how a system works, you might not know all the inner mechanisms, but you can still think of it as giving you a satisfying explanation of the output. So I think there's a really interesting question here about uh, explainable AI. There's some sense in which it's a question about user interface, which seems slightly more on the pragmatic side. But then there is a different question, which is really about what has the machine learning contributed to our knowledge? If it's giving us decisions that we don't understand, what do we require in order to understand those decisions? This is a little bit different than the question you asked, Patrick, but I'm curious about what Karina and Brendan think about uh, these discussions. Yeah, so I, I've written on this a little bit. Nobody seems to care. But <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is really, uh, a, a really big challenge that's going to be coming up in cognitive science is the issue of co complexity, which is really well understood, as I understand, in like physical systems and stuff. Um, but we have some really simplistic notions of complexity in cognitive science. So the standard way that we do is looking at like the number of parameters that a model has uh, in like a mathematical model. So like you might have a model like that has a bunch of differential equations or whatever, and you have and that's parameterized in some ways. Um, and that's a really nice setup because you can run these things like a, like a BIC or AIC and, and compare model complexity. But when we move to these machine learning algorithms that might have millions or billions of parameters, <laughs> I mean, it, it, was a, it was an issue at the very beginning of, of the parallel distributed processing, right? So you had all these well-established kind of mathematical models that people used, and then you have these new connectionist models that are much more flexible um, can do all these really amazing things. But as psychologists, we wanted to use them to understand cognition. And so I think at the beginning of, of sort of the connectionist modeling movement, that was a major criticism is that, you know, what are these models work, but what are they telling us about how, how our minds work? And so I think it, it, it has taken decades to really sort of 
figure out exactly the levels of analysis that are correct with these things. Um, and so up until like the last five years, now that we have these massive models that are like GPT, um, that are like billions and billions of parameters, which no one has any hope of understanding, you know, if, if you want to take those as realistic models of cognition, you have some problems. Like I'm a review, I am an editor of a journal and I have this, this paper that uses BERT, which is like one of these kind of big AI systems. And, you know, it, there, there are limitations to, to that approach where you don't really fully understand what that model is giving you and why it's working correctly. And so if, if we want to take these as realistic metaphors, um, you know, we have some, the science has to kind of develop and we have to figure out what the models are doing. And that's just sort of the, the process that that occurs, I guess, in, in this sort of computational world. I'm sure it happens in physics too, right? Somebody, somebody proposes this new theory and this new modeling framework and it develops, and then you sort of wheel it back and, and start to figure out, you know, what exactly it is saying rather than being super excited that it, that it, that it works at all. Could I just follow up quickly? There's, I mean, I think in the, in the physics context, the standard worry would be that you're overfitting the data, right? That if you introduce this huge, new space of possible parameter values. Um, I mean, in cosmology, it's relatively, I mean, it's getting a lot more data now, but you'd just be worried that you've introduced all these degrees of freedom and then you're just overfitting the data. And so you're not discovering regularities that you could extrapolate. You're just discovering really, really detailed regularities that apply to the specific set of data that you have and you've just massively overfit it. And so the the uh, I, the AIC and those sort of simplicity criteria are meant to then prevent you from doing that by punishing you for introducing all these extra parameters. So I think there's a very close parallel in that part of the discussion. One thing I'll just mention is that um, there's also, in addition to the area of explainable interpretable AI, um, which of course are trying to figure out ways to sort of expose or make sense of the internal workings of the machines. There's also a kind of growing area of machine teaching, um, which is about trying to use human knowledge to design more optimal training sequences for machine learning systems, as well as using machines to help teach humans, for example, to help kind of expose their own inner workings. And that has this kind of interesting history that goes back at least to the Cold War area, era uh, when psychologists like Skinner were um, trying to develop or advocating the development of teaching machines. And I think um, the idea here was to um, basically be able to more effectively train masses of students during sort of growing Cold War tensions. And I think um, similar efforts were made in, in USSR as well. So now, you know, it's a little bit different to what's going on now, of course, but it's kind of an interesting history there. And um, I have a new project where I'll be looking into this topic a little bit. So I don't, I don't have much to say now because it hasn't started, but. <laughs> There's a, a researcher at Memphis named Art Grazer who does all of these like, like virtual tutoring stuff. They do it for the military. And okay. so like you can train like 50,000 soldiers or whatever to do electrician stuff in like a week or whatever to, to, uh, and so it's kind of interesting to see how well it works. Kind of related to this issue. Um, so Karina, I know a lot of your work is focused on, on the ethics of AI and the ethical design of AI. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how models can go wrong, or at the very least, uh, we can't always be perfectly confident in the exactness of our models. We're always sort of cooking in mistakes into our models. And when it comes to just abstractly modeling the st structure of the universe, that doesn't really have too much of a bearing on day-to-day -day life. But when we're using uh, these sorts of uh, models and, and simulations in order to make judgments about things like medical care and other sorts of really important decisions like that that do impact the uh, everyday person, um, what sort of considerations do we have to keep in mind in order to sort of counteract the errors that might be made by the cooked in problems with our simulations? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it starts really early on in the design process. So about looking at your data set even and looking at who you have at the table. 
So are you bringing in different voices or are you bringing in just, you know, just the people who are building the algorithm or just developers or all, are you also including people from different disciplines with different perspectives on uh, what, whatever technology you are building and whatever application it might have, what that application might be. So that all has to be kind of, as you say, cooked into that whole process, I think needs to be this interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary perspective of, of what that technology is training on and what ideally it's going to be used for. And then that process, ideally, at some point should also involve some of the end users in that. Um, and then I think it's also really important that there's a kind of post launch evaluation phase to these different technologies. So a lot of times you just see things getting like released into the wild without, first of all, having that process of that thoughtful process and reflective process of building it, but then also not having that sort of corrective process later. And that post launch phase, I think, also helps you identify the ways in which a technology has impacted spheres of life that you may not have expected. So um, one example um, from a paper I wrote was on just YouTube's recommender algorithm and how you know, there's a sense in which YouTube is fantastic and it promotes your autonomy. You can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, you know, and that's totally different than what we were using before um, on, on the old television. Um, but as a, you know, as a result also, the way this algorithm works is that it really is very successfully designed to suck you in. And so while you have autonomy at one sphere of life, at the, the sort of this choice of interface, you can you know, type in whatever you want and search for whatever you want. There's also a sense in which you kind of lack autonomy at a different level in your life. So most of us don't want to be spending four hours every Saturday looking at cat videos. That might not have been our choice. So, so there's a sort of reflective sense in which you lose that autonomy, but also you kind of lose the autonomy of like what, what that uh, filter bubble is showing you. So as you start to engage, you start being taken down different kinds of rabbit holes. So the, the paper I wrote on this topic was looking at um, a little bit at that, uh, an article that came out of New York Times about the radicalization of a YouTube user, if you saw it. So the, the sort of a sense in which he acted very freely, but another sense in which he got really taken into that. So there, in that sense, it's affecting both that user's life, but it's also having downstream consequences to even non-users of the technology. Um, whether it's, you know, in some cases, it's the environment as a non-user, or in other cases, it's just society more generally as non or potential non-users. So there's lots of different ways in which that technology can then influence. And I think you have to have that sort of broader view as it's being, as the technology is being built. Um, some good news here is that I do think engineering programs are starting to introduce a little bit more courses and in, in looking at these broader impacts. And I think engineers have always had to think about safety precautions and, and you know, there, there's always been some thought about impact. It's just broadening that scope and thinking about it in a different way. I'm not entirely sure about engineers, but I know that at U of T, all of the math specialist students are required to take some sort of ethics course, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Really interesting. Cambridge, I know, I, can't, I wish I could remember his name right now, but um, there was a mathematician who was really promoting ethics for mathematicians and really wanted to get a program for that going. So I, I don't know where that's at now, but I didn't realize that at U of T. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I Kind of following up on that, I'd be interested in knowing what your, uh, what your thoughts are on a very sort of topical issue, which is um, kind of the, the way in which a lot of social media platforms are now looking at censorship. As, as a way of sort of trying to prevent things like conspiracy theories from spreading all over the internet and stuff like that. Um, how, cause that, that seems like a, an attempt at this sort of feedback process of realizing the kinds of uh, social impacts that these platforms provide and some of the problems with those, uh, with those platforms and then trying to go back and, and alter things to kind of correct. But I, I'd be interested in knowing your, your perspective on the, I guess the efficacy of those strategies. I'll say something briefly. I'm certainly don't have a lot of expertise on this, but my my sense is that a lot of this is coming far too late. So, for example, the idea or the decision to deplatform Trump, um, to take a specific instance, it seems like either decision you make at that point is a bad one. Um, um, I, it, it, in fact, I think it's had good consequences in a lot of ways, but like to deplatform a political person who has actually been using uh, these media to communicate with the public 
it's easy to imagine that if it was somebody you were aligned with politically, you'd feel very uncomfortable about that decision. And yet on the other hand, the amount of misinformation that was due to uh, Trump is also stunning. So I think it's, it's one of these things that the, um, I feel like we had a change in the media landscape where suddenly there were old standards about uh, uh, defamation and the ability to uh, control the spread of misinformation that just suddenly disappeared and had no, no handle on this new landscape. And we have to figure out a, a way of getting more control over that. Um, Deplatforming people is the crudest way of doing that, right? Um, and so it seems like it's essential at this point because the, progress, the, the process has gone on so long that the existence of these platforms that allow people to in effect defame and libel other people um, is really toxic to our public discourse. But this is an example of uh, somebody who didn't do what Karina was saying, which is sort of thinking about the longer term consequences of having so much of the media environment funneled through uh, these algorithms at Facebook and Twitter or you know, funneled through these platforms that then have no responsibility, no editorial responsibility for the content that's on their platforms. I completely agree. And I agree that it's not going to be the most effective method as well. I mean, it's a whack-a-mole method essentially right now. Um, and <laughs> so it's pe other people will appear. And, and so there has to be a more systematic way of doing that. And it's not to, uh, not to say that I disagree with the choice though. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that um, what we've seen is that some of the more emotionally charged content gets more engagement and the algorithms are being designed to increase engagement and to sort of support those who get engagement. And so just because engagement and clicks now is the new economy, then so, this, so something there has to change about that whole um, system in a sense. And I don't necessarily have solutions, but. So there are a couple of questions in the chat or, or in the Q&A. Um, the first one, uh, is from Adam and it says, I've seen much work lately on using machine learning to generate simulated cosmology data without directly evaluating the underlying physics, usually training off smaller scale simulations. How do you feel about this further layer of opacity as it relates to the value of the simulation results? Um, I'm sorry to say, I don't actually know a lot about this particular case. I mean, I know that, um, so in cosmology and in other areas of physics, you often, uh, in some sense, generate data by using some techniques. So you often like in, uh, so here's a, 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 maybe an analogous case in climate science where often there's an initial part where they, they would love to have temperature measurements all over the globe, but they in fact have temperature measurements in some locations over the globe. But then to compare the simulations with the data, they then first take a kind of, elaborated data model where they kind of project the temperature measurements that they have into temperature measurements all over the globe so that they can compare them with the simulations. So it's partly you're sort of processing the data initially and then that will make it easier to compare a simulation. So I don't know if that's what's going on here, but that's a pretty common thing and it's, it's not troubling as long as the initial processing to get a uh, full data set is relatively independent of the questions you're trying to assess or the things that you doubt about the simulation. I mean, it does mean that the old picture of you predict something and then you check the evidence um, is getting a lot more complicated, right? So there's several intermediate steps there. Um, but I, I actually just don't know enough about the case that Adam is mentioning here. If it's like that, which it might be, then it's sort of pre-processing the data on some level so that the comparisons with the simulation are easier. Um, and that is a common practice, which I think is a different, would lead to a different kind of question than the question that I'm worried about with the opacity that results from the kind of holism of the simulations. Okay, and the, and the other, well, thank you for that answer, first of all, but the other question um, that was raised is on the question of understanding outputs and not really understanding what the input was, 
is this a problem? Is is this not a problem with pretty much any and every knowledge structure? And can we accurately measure or monitor any source or origin or input? Um, can we ever observe the real? I guess the the real underlying structure of something. Um, yeah, uh, I'll I'll let you all take it away with that one. Well, there. I mean, this might be about the, the question of opacity here that I was raising. So really, I, I'm not sure if that's what Milan is concerned with, but the, I think it is a distinctive issue for simulations compared to other areas of science. So if you have a relatively straightforward modeling situation where you can solve a system of equations and then compare those results relatively directly to measurable quantities, then I think you have you know, a relatively straightforward assessment. Whereas with simulations, the complexity of the systems just make it really unclear what the different components that you've built into the simulation are actually contributing to the output. So you can, I mean, it's really, you can think of it as if I tweaked this model. So for example, in galaxy formation simulations, one thing that is hard to incorporate are small scale phenomena. So if you have a supernova, that's, that's essentially the scale of the sun, right? That's a very small thing, way smaller than the things that you're modeling. And yet, because it throws out gas at high velocities, it has an impact on a huge part of the environment of the galaxy. And so if you wanna ask, what's the impact of the way I model supernova? Well, you have a specific set of assumptions that you put in your model where you just say, let's assume that supernova happen and they throw out gas at this rate. And you can try tweaking that to see what the consequences are. But often it's really hard to follow through that chain of reasoning to see. Because uh, you might think, well, my so one thing that uh, the early models, the disks weren't fluffy enough. So the you'd have a spiral galaxy with a disk that was too compressed. And so the thought was, if you put supernova in, then they'll fluff up a little bit. So there'll be more velocity dispersion. So, and the thought was, can you do that? Well. It turns out that incorporating supernova was an invaluable part of that, but sort of the direct causal argument that I did this and then that changed the output. The simulations are just too complex for that to be to be clear. And so I think it really is the opacity is a distinctive feature of simulations that we just can't follow through the reasoning. So. So in, in terms of sort of cognitive science, it goes back to what Karina was talking about with like the amount of input to that a human being kind of receives where, you know, GPT-3 or whatever receives, reads the internet, um, but a baby has all these things around it and it's, it's doing all this stuff. Um, and so like, like when we try to construct a model of, of how a group of humans might behave in a certain situation, you know, it's impossible to, to account for all this, this variance that, you know, I grew up in a really small town in, in Ontario, somebody who grew up in like Beijing or whatever is going to have much different input. How I approach this problem in, in my own research, because that's kind of what I'm interested in is how differential experience uh, leads to, to differences in cognition, is to build um, demographically organized information. So um, the last few years I've been building a like a, a data database of books that are organized by like who wrote them and then then understand like nationality and gender and date of birth and that sort of thing. And so we can train models with say say um, books written by somebody in the UK versus books written by people who were born in the USA. And we can look at the divergence of those models. So then we can evaluate how those models um, fit to like data collected in the UK versus data collected in the, in the USA. And so you, you find the predictable um, sort of response where the models trained on UK data are better, better fit to, to UK based participants. And so then that's a really high level sort of analysis. Hopefully you can then start to segregate these, these issues where you can better understand the training materials that you're given to a model in order to understand what the output is. And so um, instead of taking this like sort of holistic approach where you just train it with everything that you have, you want to be a little bit targeted in terms of what the inputs are given to the model so that you understand how like giving it this input versus this input changes models behavior, a model's behavior. I think yeah, along. Oh, sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Karina. 
No, no, sorry, Hannah. Uh, I was just going to say, no, I wasn't going to add much because I, I don't know it that well, but there is there is some interesting work too, I think, in um, animal psychology of looking at, for example, freshly hatched chickens to figure out what kind of, so there you can really control for what kind of input they've had, right? They're just out of the egg. And then, and just to kind of learn about, obviously imprinting is the, the main interest there, but also about priors in animals. So I know, I know that some researchers, for example, I think it's Elizabeth Versace is working on stuff like this. Um, so at least if someone's interested in looking it up. <laughs> but of course- lots of really, really interesting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just gonna say, well, of course we can't do that in humans, all the experiments you wanna run, right? So, so this is, <laughs> go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, so, so there's lots of old research in psychology looking at like, um, perceptual limitations in infancy. So like people, babies who were born with cataracts or with hearing issues, which are corrected now, but looking at how that impairs like vision or, or uh, auditory processing later on. And so like the, the impacts of like having a cataract for like a month or something, this was done at York University in Toronto actually, um, is like the, the, the people are, are basically blind when they're, when they're adults. Like this early input stage is, is super important in, in uh, the development of the brain. That's really fascinating, actually. Um, so th thanks for all of your answers to that. Uh, we have another question in the Q&A. This one comes from Paul. And the question is, uh, this is probably best directed, I think, to you, Brendan. Uh, it's what would it mean to say that an artificial system semantically understands something, such as the meaning of a word? Are there any current systems that can be said to semantically understand some domain? Well, <laughs> um, so this is kind of a, a gets into philosophy, which, as I stated at the beginning of my talk, I'm not very familiar with. But like intentionality, I think, has a huge connection to like knowledge, like being able to use knowledge to impact something is kind of the definition of it. Um, and so by that kind of criterion, we're not even close, I would say. Uh, it, that's not actually true. So like, like, let's say you're thinking about like a factory or whatever. Like if you can train a machine learning algorithm to build a car, like that, that robot and that, that algorithm has figured out some, some knowledge about you know, that process. Uh, in terms of language, how we evaluate things is to collect behavioral data. So we ask people like rate how similar these two words are, or, Rate how like like con construct a response to the sentence or whatever. And then we can get our 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 models to do the same thing, and and we can evaluate how well the models fit. And for some data, the models do really well. For other data, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, so like from like like do we have a model that can? So we actually have good models that can do syntactic processing, which is always considered the the like big problem in linguistics. Like, so like GPT-3 can construct um, syntactically correct sentences pretty easy that are pretty good. And like, I have done some work in that domain too. And like, it's not that hard to get these models to like talk in a way that's reasonable to, to people, but like, do they actually understand what they're saying? There's no, there's no, there's no actual understanding. Um, and so like, like going from what we have to like that, is a huge divide that I don't even know exactly how you would go about doing it because it requires all this extra stuff like like intentionality and theory of mind and and being embedded in an environment and being able to manipulate an environment and so yeah I, I think in like in in limited domains like where machine learning and and uh, AI kind of stuff is being used to to do certain tasks that's sort of where that kind of question is going to arise um but that also has ethical issues like replacing human labor and stuff so <laughs> i don't know can i um add, I, I do think that gpt3 has i don't know how good it is but i think they have a what's called a semantic search too so now if you search for like um I don't know, I'm trying to have really bad examples, but if you search for like violence or something like a command F search, it will try to find things that have similar semantic values. So, and, and it will do that, not just like with a, a synonym search, but it will be a little bit more sophisticated than that. So that's kind of interesting where it's not just a pure syntactic search. I think it's kind of interesting. And I also think that um, GPT-3 has performed, I think fairly well on Winograd schema challenges. So um, for those who aren't familiar with those, um, these are like sentences that uh, 
will usually, I think, just differ in one word, um, but differ quite critically. So the classic example is like the sentence, the committee denied the group a parade permit because they advocated violence versus the committee denied the group a parade permit because they feared violence. So the only thing that's changed there is advocated or feared, right? But the reference of they in each sentence, I think it's, it's officially ambiguous, but it changes, right? And it changes to either the committee or, and it's based on your worldly knowledge. So we tend to interpret that correctly because we have arguably this background worldly knowledge about what committees tend to behave like and what people in parades tend to behave like. And so that's the example that Dennett gives like in his article, uh, Can Machines Think? And I think um, GPT-3 did perform fairly well on some, some of those tests too, which is kind of interesting, which is not to say that it understands, but it's just kind of <laughs> an enhancement, <laughs> just to clarify. Yeah, the models like in terms of how we think language works do really well, like it's, and it's not even like I can, I have a, I can train a model in five minutes and it will do pretty good, right? Like it comes out with interesting things. And like, so it's like going from that to like, how do you manipulate that information in, 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 in useful ways? So I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how you, how you, how you go from like this thing. I think it's a general issue in like machine learning. How do you go from learning information to utilizing information? And so I think like GPT-3 and all these really big neural networks learn information, learn everything that could possibly be learned from their data. The question is, how do you integrate that into something bigger? Um, and like in psychology, things like reasoning and stuff and creativity is just, it lags behind other aspects of the field. I'm curious, this, this raises a, a question for me, which is, um, um, is it possible to think of distinct cognitive capacities as something that artificial intelligence could imitate rather than having them all bundled together in the way that we happen to have them bundled together, right? So, I mean, it, so, you know, you, you might have something that does semantic processing in one sense, but doesn't seem, you know, lacks all kinds of other things. It's not able to use or act on the information. So in some sense, it doesn't display understanding in the way that we would understand that to be manifest. But I mean, is there a more fundamental question? Like, is there a clear way of distinguishing cognitive capacities so that you could ask, does this artificial system display X? Is the real question that we don't actually have a clear enough way of distinguishing X from all of our other capacities? Yeah, I think that's really interesting, Chris. Um, it definitely seems to be like, when we try to apply these psychological terms to AI systems, often these systems are only trying to replicate a very narrow aspect of a full mm -hmm. agent. And so you run into certain problems in trying to apply those terms. And um, one great piece on this, which I referred to earlier was Marta Helena's work on creativity. And there she looks, it's creativity in AI. I think it's called insightful AI. It's coming out in mind and language. But there she looks at like a comparative psychology definition of creativity. So how do we, how do we test for that in animals, for example? Because often part of the problem here too is that we're, I say we are very liberal here, but some people are very, are very free in attributing psychological terms to AI um, and they don't hold AI systems to the same rigorous standards that we hold animals to, you know, whereas people in comparative psychology sometimes are really careful in saying, look, we don't, we're not sure yet if a, if a system is conscious or has thoughts or has beliefs or is creative or has theory of mind or has any of those things. And so by looking at some of those tasks and then trying to find ways of using those same tasks to make the comparisons with machines. And so in the case of creativity, for example, usually the underlying mechanisms are thought to be uh, mental scenario building and um, domain generality. And so there she tries to assess, well, how did AlphaGo, for example, actually beat uh, Lisa Dahl? What was actually done in that, uh, in that system? And what she ends up arguing is that it lacks domain generality. And so does AlphaZero, by the way, because that's usually the follow-up question. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it has something analogous to mental scenario building. And so what's interesting there, part of the, the conclusion there is like, it's really interesting that we can build a system that can be so so creative and so transformative and yet do it in a way that's different than how we do it. That's interestingly different than how we do it. Yeah, that's, inter that's really interesting. And it, I was just thinking of what Karina was talking about with like extended cognition and stuff. I think in, so I work with Alzheimer's patients a little bit, but um, 
that's going to be a huge area where these kind of systems can be applied, right? So Alzheimer's patients really early on in their um, um, disease progression have issues with memory and language. So let's say you have you know, a, a model that can summarize an email in, in a few words and that, that can be presented to the patient rather than, um, um, than, than, than having to, to process all of it. Um, and so things like that, like these automated kind of processes that can take the input that somebody receives and summarize it and, you know, do useful stuff with it and then present it to the patient, you know, that's going to be, that could be huge, huge, hugely uh, uh, impactful on, on, you know, a very large uh, patient population. Yeah, I'll also say just to um, add to that, Brendan, too, also for sort of a wide range of other different conditions. So also people, for example, with learning disabilities or learning challenges, a way in which a system can be, um, or people on the autistic spectrum, for example, a way in which a system can be personalized and understand what types of learning works for certain individuals or doesn't work for other kinds of individuals, given the capacities that they have or given their kind of current situation. And, and how that changes over time. So there's so much possibility there. I actually have a chapter coming out on AI extenders and mental health. So if anyone's interested. <laughs> Especially if it can go from verbal to, to non-verbal information because a lot of, especially in learning disabilities and autism, a lot of the, the individuals have issues with primarily pro processing verbal information. And so if you have a system that can take language and, and, and dictate non-verbal kind of, kind of information could be huge. So there's a question in the chat that is directed toward Chris that says, is there an example of a cosmological simulation that stands that stands out to you in regard to its credibility and clarity? So let me answer the question in a slightly different way. So there's a lot of cosmo cosmological simulations that do different things which are credible, but the, the thing that I find striking looking at the community is that there's two sort of very different mindsets. There's one mindset, which is give me the biggest supercomputer you have and I'll design a simulation that uses all of those resources to its full capacity. And so that's sort of throw everything in, including the kitchen sink, have all of the physics modeled in some way and then see what you can do. And you have to, and so whatever the biggest supercomputers are, there's always some of them running these large scale formation, structure formation models. That's one of the computationally intensive projects that uh, get, gets run on these large supercomputers. There's a different approach. There's some, so I'm thinking of, uh, so my views on this are shaped by James Bullock and there's a group at the UC Irvine that I've talked to about this. And his approach is, uh, and this is reflected in some of the models they've built, it's very different where it's more you design sort of minimalist models where you try to incorporate just the sort of minimally sufficient physics in order to model a particular type of phenomenon. And the idea is that th that can promote physical understanding in a way that these large scale models can't. And so I think there's a really interesting divide in the community where you see the uh, see some disagreement about what the advantages of different simulation approaches are. And so the other thing is there's just a huge range of different simulations. So there's um, simulations that focus on individual galaxies. There's simulations that try to do the whole observed universe. And so, you know, there's a whole range of different types of things you can try to simulate. But I think there's a really interesting divide in just the approach and what they think of as uh, the best simulation for enhancing our understanding of the systems. So, Surprisingly, we're already into the last five minutes of the time that we have scheduled for this, which is, it just flew by. Um, but we've got a few more questions queued up from the Q&A, so I figure we just roll with those. Um, so the next one we've got is a question from Kai, who asks, uh, what makes AI trustworthy and what kind of trusts do scientists place in AI? If the success of AI justifies its trustworthiness, how much do we understand about why AI is so successful? i.e. what part of its formalism leads to its success. When trusting the results of an AI, is it more like taking the testimony of an expert from a field we do not fully understand, or more like trusting the results of a tool or what? So that's a big question. Um, 
but I'll, I'll throw it out into the, into the void. I'll just start by saying I don't have a good answer to this question. So just to break the ice, because I think we're all trying to think about how to answer it and leaning further away. Um, yeah, I do think so. I will say I think there's a rich discussion around trustworthy AI that includes a lot more than just how we understand the system and to what extent we rely on it for evidence. I think it includes sort of discussions around, you know, to what extent are these systems embedding social biases? To what extent are they violating our privacy? To what extent do they um, create divides in society or divides in our solidarity or fairness divides um, or concerns about autonomy? So there's, so there's, there's lots of other things built into the usual discussion around trustworthy AI, I guess I'll just say. Um, but when you get further into the comment about questions about how should we take these as, um, pieces like testimony, which I think is a nice kind of analogy, um, or as other kinds of evidence. And I'm, I'm not sure I would be interested, of course, to hear what, what Chris and Brendan think about how science, how practitioners in your fields tend to view this. But I think viewing it like evidence is, is a good, good way to view it. And, and then we can ask what kind of evidence and how do we probe at that evidence. And I think that kind of goes beyond what I can contribute right now. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, go ahead, Brent. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think a lot of this is going to be litigated with autonomous cars in the near future with them killing people or whatever. <laughs> and so it's just going to be lawyers, you know, whole careers are going to be de devoted to ethical AI. I'll just throw in one other comment, which is that it's striking that I think a lot of people on the policy side take AI tools as being more objective, that they're seen as the, it's kind of the comparative judgment that's important. If you have some system for say evaluating teachers and people have tried using like machine learning techniques to replace just the principle evaluating the teacher. So there's probably flaws in the human system already, um, but the AI systems, often the policymakers just think, oh, it's inherently more objective, which is, not true. It's really just going to probably perpetuate whatever was not objective in the data set that you trained it on. So it's, it's, I, that's a worrisome thing that people are over trusting AI just because it's this sort of seen as this technical algorithmic solution. Here, here. And I think that's uh, especially important when it comes to like, if we use a system and it trains on a particular data set and that data set never gets adjusted or it never gets retrained, then we're really just taking a time slice of what reality looked like and doing something with that and not allowing natural sort of the evolution of that data set that would occur in real life. So, so there's lots of problems with that. <laughs> All right, sorry, go ahead, Hannah. No, oh, okay. Um, well, we have one more question, but before that, I just, I really enjoyed the um, uh, self-driving car example because uh, people who are, people who I talk to are often very opposed to self-driving cars because of the, I guess, to use the term opacity of the, of the algorithm, like we don't fully know how the car is driving. Uh, I always like to poke fun and say, well, we let humans drive cars before we understood the brain. Um, and that, that's usually my response, even though I don't necessarily think that's a good reason to advocate for self-driving cars. But there is one last question, which is, this is directed towards Karina, but of course anyone can answer or contribute. Do you think trying to make um, the decisions made by AI or algorithms understandable hinders the creative potential of AI or do such developments in algorithmic design make it easier to collaborate and learn from AI or both? Well, thanks for the question. It's a good question. I think my answer is probably both or depending on <clears throat> like what happens in which situation. So it, <clears throat> it seems to me that there are competing values when we design these systems. I mean, there, there are competing values when we design these systems and, and then these values come into all sorts of kind of tensions, I guess. So, you can imagine that we want a system that makes really accurate predictions about something. The more accurate we want it to be, 
potentially we have to feed it more data and we have to put more hidden layers in. And so that system becomes increasingly complex and as a trade-off, it's less explainable or interpretable. So if we simplify a system, it's more inter it's easier to understand usually how it works. But that simplification comes at the cost of things like accuracy sometimes. And so likewise, if we, if we want to optimize for something like creativity, we want it to be really transformative. That what, what we do to that system and how we design it might look differently than if we want to optimize something else. And those tensions occur all over the place, especially when we have ethical decisions too. So just circling back to some of the things we talked about. So we, in some contexts, like let's say policing, we really value, or healthcare, we really value accuracy, um, but we also value privacy. And so the more data we give to the system, the more accurate it might be, but that might also come at the cost of us all kind of giving some of our data to this greater good of being able to have these accurate systems. So there, there's, you know, trade-offs between privacy and and accuracy, trade-offs between fairness and accuracy, trade-offs between personalization and solidarity, and trade-offs between convenience and privacy. So there's all these sorts of complicated trade-offs that have to happen. And, and I think this is just one of them that you put your finger on. Well, that sounds like a really great place to put a cap on things. Um, this has been a really awesome discussion. There have been a lot of really cool questions from the audience and a lot of really cool stuff that you guys have brought up. I think it's been a really, really great time. So, so thank you very much to all of our speakers for being willing to participate in this. It's been great. Thanks to you guys for organizing as well. And nice to meet Brendan and Chris. Yep. Thanks. Everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much. This is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We should also probably thank uh, our sponsors. So there's two groups who have supported us in getting our website up and getting the Zoom going and everything like that. So we've been supported by the U of T Student Initiative Fund and something at McGill as well, I think. I always forget. Yeah, and the McGill Postgraduate Student Society. So thanks to those people because some of these online things get a little expensive. Um, so it's great that we were able to put this together. And thank you again to our speakers. Um, yeah, the, the discussion was really illuminating. And I think we all have a lot to, to think about for the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend. And um, yeah, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.